<laughs> Last week we looked at Jesus on what has come to be called the Mount of Transfiguration, where he took Peter, James, and John up the mountain and they saw him transfigured into his glorious self. Shining brightly, bright white clothing, and all those things that were associated with that. Moses and Elijah appearing to talk with him. The voice of the Father coming out of the cloud, and the cloud was the glory of God. Actually, I think we looked at that two weeks ago, maybe. Today, we find them at the foot of that mountain. And that wonderful mountaintop experience uh, is suddenly gone. If you've ever known a spiritual high, and none of us has ever had the experience that they had on that mountain, but a spiritual high or a mountaintop experience that uh, sometimes you get these maybe when you go to a conference or a retreat and the music is really good and the speaking is really good and the Lord is presented in the word and the, and, and the worship is strong and, and extensive. It kind of goes on and on and people are closing their eyes and in time, boy, you're just locked into this and, and, you, and you eat lunch with each other and you eat dinner with each other and maybe you're talking about the word that you've just heard and, and you know, if you've known those kinds of experiences, you know that those, that doesn't tend to go home with you. You leave the mountaintop and when you go back home, it's the real world. Not that that's not the real world, that's probably the most real that we could ever experience because it's the presence of the Lord and we're locked in on Him and that's what eternity is, for eternity we're going to have that kind of communion with the Lord. But in this world, what I'm calling the real world, we could call it the day-to-day -day world. You go home and you find that people don't get it and you try to explain. You say, oh, it was like I closed my eyes and I I forgot the people were around me. It's like Jesus was there with me. And I, and I felt like a sponge just, and the water that was saturating me was the Lord himself. And, and, uh, and people will just look at you and say, oh, that's nice. I'm glad you had a good time. <laughs> and, and you go away saying, why don't they get it? How can I not explain this? You know, it's sort of like when Moses would meet with the Lord on the mountain and then he, he would, his face would glow when he met with the Lord. And then he would come down from the mountain and be around the people and over time the glow would fade away. It's back to the same old, same old, day in, day out, living with the people who never seem to get it. And you want to say, oh, if only they could see the Lord, what the Lord is like when I meet with him on that mountain. And yet they don't. The spiritual highs, like I said, they're sometimes called mountaintop experiences and they are wonderful. Just because we can't have them all the time doesn't mean we should never have them. They're wonderful and, and you can have those kinds of experiences with the Lord, those deep times of communion, focus, your heart is bowed before Him. <clears throat> you, you can have those times without going to a retreat, without going to a conference. I've had them at my desk, having my daily devotionals. And, and you know, you can have that because it's the Word and you're taking in the Word and, and maybe you've got some music going with that too, some really good praise music, and, and you're just understanding things about the Lord, about His glory, about His mercy, about His love, about, how, about a calling He's putting on your life and, and things like that. And those are very, very sweet times. Those are mountaintop experiences when you're full of the Lord. 
I think the desire for that probably is what lay behind Peter's, you know, off the cuff remark because he didn't know what else to say. Hey, Lord, it's great that we're here. Why don't we build a tent for you and a tent for Moses and a tent for Elijah? We should just stay here because it was glorious. It was glorious. And sometimes it's, it's hard to think of leaving that. It's like, Lord, why can't it be like this all the time? Why can't I sense your presence like this all the time? And yet, when we we're on the mountaintop and we we're away from what's going on down at the foot of the mountain, there is stuff going on down there that needs to be addressed by the people who have been filled with the Lord on the mountaintop. There is work to be done. Work to be done for the Lord. Our text places Peter, James, and John down at the foot of the mountain. And it's going to uh, show us three issues that we will face as we follow and serve Jesus in this world, in the day-to-day -day real life of this world. We might, we might want it to be communion and peace and glory and all that sort of thing all the time. But when we come down from the mountain and back into the world at the foot of the mountain, we find the world carrying on as it carries on. We find even the church carrying on as it carries on, and it's not like it was on the mountaintop. Three things that we must face as we follow and serve Jesus in this world. Now, I want to read the text first, and then we'll come back and, and look at those three things. We're in verses, uh, Mark chapter 9, and we're in verses 14 through 19. And when they came to the disciples, so that's Peter, James, John, Jesus coming down from the mountain. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them. The disciples they came to were the other nine disciples, the nine that didn't get to go up the mountain with Jesus. They've been holding down the fort back in the real world. And so a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, that being Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And so that doesn't sound anything like up on the mountaintop. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on down there. We're going to look at the three things that I see in there. One issue that we must face as we follow Jesus is opposition. Opposition. There's not opposition up on the mountain when it's, when it's you and the Lord and, and you got his word open and, and you're receptive. If there's any opposition, it would be the opposition of your own heart trying to argue with the Lord about what his word is saying because you don't like it. But when you are locked in, worshiping him, submitted to his word, and uh, just enjoying that time with the Lord, there's no opposition. But I'm telling you, as soon as you open the door and come out of your room, there can be opposition, depending upon who's living in your house. And if it's not going on in your house, you open the door and step outside, and there's opposition. Opposition to the Lord, opposition to the things of the Lord. These nine apostles here who stayed back in the real world, they were embroiled in real world stuff when Jesus and Peter and James and John came down from the mountain. There was no opposition for them up there. That's why Peter wants to stay there. What a peaceful place. This is awesome. Lord, we've never seen you like this before. You are glowing and your clothes are brighter than, whiter than white. And Moses and Elijah, I mean, we've heard about them all our lives. And wow, the voice of the Father. And oh, this is awesome. On the mountain was the reality of eternity. 
But down below was the reality of this hiccup that we call time. Because compared to eternity, it is like a hiccup. It's just, <laughs> and it's over. Seems like it's been around forever for us. It's been around longer than we've been around. It will be, long, be around after we are gone. But compared to eternity, it's nothing. It's a blip. And yet down below at the foot of the mountain, that's what's going on. The stuff of time rather than the stuff of eternity. Now I suppose this disputation that's going on had to do with these nine apostles being unable to cast the demon out of this boy. I mean, Jesus comes down and says, hey, what are you arguing about? And the father jumps in and before anybody can answer and say, well, we did this, the scribe said this, and we said that. The father is just and says, I brought my son and they couldn't cast the demon out. And you can just see the scribes coming along and saying, ha, ha, ha. Of course you can't cast the demon out because you don't have the same demon that your master has. Remember they accused him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub earlier. You can just hear that kind of thought. Or, of course you can't cast this demon out. Your master hasn't taught you his parlor tricks yet that he uses for this. And they're down there. They've been on... A journey going out from place to place Jesus sent them out they've been out casting out demons and now here they are and they're unable to do this one the scribes are getting on them about it and the father is probably there saying why can't you do this why can't you do this your your master is healing people all over the place just a lot of commotion going on especially this opposition that's coming from the scribes and so Jesus walks up and says, hey, what are you arguing about? And the crowd sees him and they go wild. Oh, all of a sudden, we don't care about all this other stuff. Jesus is here. Let's go watch the show. And they're all excited about Jesus being there. It's hard coming down from the mountaintop with the Lord and back into the face of opposition and yet that's what we will find as long as we draw breath on this earth. If we belong to the Lord and we, and we allow that belonging to show in our lives, there will be opposition. Even if we're quiet about it, we won't be able to turn on our TVs or our radios without hearing somebody mocking and belittling the things that, that we embrace with all of our hearts. And you can start to feel kind of alone in this world. You start to feel like an outcast. You start to think, boy, I remember the days when I actually fit in. That was kind of nice. I don't fit in anymore. I kind of miss that. And some people will look at that and want to go back and start fitting in. But I tell you, once you have the Lord in your heart, it's hard to go back and do that. You have to press through a lot of through a lot of the Holy Spirit convicting you until you become used to the idea again of fitting in with the world. And it's not a good place to be. The world is headed for destruction. I don't know why we would want to fit in with that. I remember going to the Promise Keepers gatherings back in the 90s. And they were a big deal back then. Filling football stadiums. And when I was pastoring in Massachusetts, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe two, three, four times, um, I led groups of men to Promise Keepers events. And you would go there and it would be several days of, of just, uh, um, I think it was several days, maybe it was a full day and a half a day, or, but it was overnight anyway. And, and you would be there and, and all these speakers, uh, usually uh, Jack Hayford was there and, and uh, Tony Evans was a big part of it and Joseph Stoll, who at the time was the president of Moody Bible Institute and, and on and on and on it went with these people that I often heard on the radio and, uh, and, and just really pointing us to the Lord, but also uh, calling us to live as men of God, 
to be a man of God toward our wives, a man of God toward our families, a man of God toward uh, our jobs and our careers. And, and they had seven promises of a promise keeper. And it was all about getting serious about the Lord, men, and fulfilling the roles that God has given you as a man in this world. And, uh, and I'm telling you, the fellowship was great and the book tables were great and uh, everything about it. I would be so full of the Lord when I could tell we were coming down to the end of the conference. The last guy was speaking and he'd already been going for half an hour. And I'm thinking, oh, we've only got a few minutes of this left. Can't we come back for one more day, you know? And, um, and then it would end. And, and be thinking, man, I am going to go back and I'm so on fire with the Lord and I can't wait to share all of this stuff. And, and um, no sooner do you walk out of the stadium and get in the car and turn on the radio than the mocking begins, the opposition. You know, one of them the, on the mall in Washington, D.C., they had between six and 800,000 men gathered on the mall. And I was one of them. And, and uh, got in the car, turned on the radio. The place was, was pretty spotless. Six to 800,000 men and nobody left garbage on the ground. In fact, so all the garbage was taken to the, to the waste baskets that were there to the point that those things were overflowing and there was a tower of garbage surrounding the waste baskets, but everyone did their best to put it where it belonged. And then we got in the car and one of the DJs on some local radio station are saying, yeah, the Promise Keeper's gathering, yeah, just wrapped up today. And, and you know, uh, after an event like that, the garbage is terrible and those poor workers have to come out and clean up after all. I just went on and on. And I'm sitting there in the car yelling at the radio. It was spotless. <laughs> Our testimony of being considerate people in the name of Jesus is being robbed from us by people who weren't even there because they just assumed the worst. That's opposition. We face opposition in this world and we are going to face opposition in this world. But you know, it's because people are opposed to Jesus down here at the foot of the mountain that we need to be here. I, the Lord... If, if the Lord had for us constant mountaintop experiences, and that was his plan for us, he would just, we would say, we, we would come to faith in Jesus, and he would say, okay, come home. <laughs> and we would go and commune with him for all of eternity. He leaves us here because there's stuff to be done here. He came into this world to die for the sins of mankind, and he calls his church to represent him while he's gone in this place. And that representation is going to bring opposition. But it's because people need the Lord that they oppose the Lord. It's because they need the Lord that the people of the Lord need to be here. And we need to face and endure the opposition for his sake. We could hide ourselves on a mountain, we could cloister ourselves in a monastery, we could lock the door in a room and never come out and ask people to please just slide food under the little slot that we cut into the door and, and just stay in there and commune with the Lord all the time. But what good would that do for the things that God wants done in this world? It would accomplish none of the things that God wants done in this world. We may need the mountaintop from time to time, but the world that opposes Jesus needs to see Jesus in us. And so he won't let us stay there. It's, there's too much stuff happening down at the foot of the mountain. And so down we come. A second issue we must face as we follow Jesus is human need. Human need. This man in this text was so desperate. He was so desperate that when Jesus says, what are you arguing about? The man interrupts any opportunity anybody's got to answer that question and says, I have this son. He's possessed of a demon. It does all these violent things to him, destructive things. We're going to look at those next week. 
But I, I brought him to you. Your disciples tried to cast the demon out. Implied is, I brought him to you, but you weren't here. <laughs> so your disciples tried to take care of it, and they couldn't. Big, massive, human need. I mean, imagine being the parent of this child. It says, uh, verse 18, whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. I mean, that, that's awful stuff. It's, it's going to go on and, uh, and, and say, uh, say later that it has often thrown him into the fire, and it's thrown him into water, and it's tried to destroy him. We'll talk some more about what about that scenario itself. I'll, I'll just say in passing here that some people say, oh, that sounds like he's having an epileptic seizure. And, and I've even heard pastors say, you know, in modern times we know that this was epilepsy. Well, it wasn't just natural epilepsy. If it was, then Jesus was wrong to cast a demon out of him. The scriptures are wrong to tell us it was caused by a demon. Just because it might look like epilepsy doesn't mean it was just a natural case of epilepsy. And the first century people didn't understand that. They thought it was a demon. If the word says it was a demon, it was a demon. If Jesus cast out a demon, it was a demon causing it. The demon might have made the kid seize in a way that an epileptic would seize. But this was a demonic attack going on. I probably just gave away a whole point from next week, but we'll come back and visit it again uh, when, when we get there. But um, you can just imagine being this parent. The boy's got seizures, uh, this harmful behavior, throwing him into the fire, throwing him into water. And when Jesus addresses the demon down verse 25, he says, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. So there may have been deafness going on here. We, we see the father referred to him as having a mute demon. So the boy apparently can't hear, can't speak, and he's seizing in very violent and destructive ways, and it's been going on for a long time. And it's a great and massive need. Now, not everybody has a need that's that obvious but I tell you something and we all know this because we're all humans every crowd of people that you can encounter is full of needs of some kind every crowd of people is full of needs now the ultimate need is spiritual they need to know Jesus they need to have their eternity with him secure by believing on him. But sometimes we Christians will say, oh, we're not going to get involved in those physical needs because it's the spiritual need that's important. We need to focus all our time on that. And yet we find that Jesus, Jesus focused on physical needs sometimes. Um, the, I'm going back not just Jesus, but the word of God, what God uh, called the children of Israel to. Uh, we see how they were called to take care of widows and orphans and their need. That would mean places to live. That would mean uh, financial help. And James in the New Testament says that's what true religion is, looking after widows and orphans in their time of need. So Old Testament, New Testament, it's there. John says in, in 1 John uh, 3.17, he says, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So if we look at the need of a brother or sister in Christ and say, oh, well, they'll figure it out when we can help. John is saying, how, how can you say the love of God is there? So these physical needs that we have in life, these are not things to be ignored. The Lord didn't ignore them. The Word of God doesn't ignore them. 
doesn't mean that the spiritual needs aren't there too and those need to be addressed, but needy people are needy people, regardless of what the needs are. Now, one thing about the mountaintop experience, as beautiful and glorious as it is, we can get selfish up there on the mountaintop. We can say, I don't want to be bothered with all the, the needs. Lord, this is good. Just let me enjoy your presence. Somebody knocks on the door, they need something. Oh, Lord, I just want to stay on this mountaintop with you. And what is a, a beautiful, glorious time with the Lord that the Lord is providing turns into something where we want it because we want it. Not because of who the Lord is. And when we start getting selfish like that, then we don't want to reach out and get our hands dirty and take the time and be bothered with the needs of people. We don't find that from Jesus, do we? So, Jesus, who had said, and we referred to this recently a few times, we'll refer to it again, he had said the way things were going to go down as time was unfolding rapidly here for his time on earth. He says, eight, chapter 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And then down in verse 34, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's not mountaintop stuff. That's, that's down at the foot of the mountain. That's down in the valley of the mountain. That's down underneath the valley of the mountain. You know, getting down in the nitty gritty of life and serving Jesus there, and part of that is, is uh, being available to meet the needs of people in the name of Jesus. Because it's Jesus. Jesus is what they need regardless of whether it's a spiritual need or a physical need, they, they need Jesus as part of how we're helping them. And so what does Jesus say to this man? He says, bring the boy to me. Bring him to the one who can meet this need. And so if our lives are wrapped up in Jesus, you know, we've been on a mountaintop, now we're back in the world, but instead of letting the world dissipate all that and we forget that it ever happened we say boy i know this lord that i just spent time on the mountaintop with and so i'm bringing him into all this mess because I, this this mess is too big for me i'll wind up in the same mess if i try to do all this on my own but i'm going to come down in the power of jesus and i'm just going to let him shine in the midst of all this darkness going on down here and um and see what he does in the lives of these people. See, the believer is not truly living unless he's bringing Jesus to this needy world. Can you imagine the glory that Jesus left to come down and, and do the work to be our Savior? Living in, in all of it, he didn't have to be bothered with any of this from, from eternity past. The limitations of living in this flesh and and, and the rejection he would receive from people in the world. And yet he did it. He did it. And we have a third issue here that we must face as we follow Jesus, and that is a lack of faith. Continuing on there in verse uh, 18, looking at the, towards the, uh, the end of the verse, the man says, I asked your disciples to cast it out. And they were not able, and he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And so we see, uh, we see a lack of faith. Jesus is saying on the part of these disciples who were unable to cast out this demon, we certainly see a lack of faith on the part of the scribes who are here opposing the whole thing. And we even see a lack of faith on the part of this dad. It's not seem very obviously in our text this morning, but it's in uh, the text we'll look at next week where he comes to the point where he says to Jesus, I, I believe, help my unbelief, <laughs> you know? Because uh, the faith that we show is far from a perfect faith, even when we have it. 
So the world lacks faith, but so do we. And, you know, that time on the mountaintop, that's where you believe the Lord implicitly. I and mean, you're reading about something he did in the life of Abraham or something he did in the life of David or you're reading the Psalms or you're reading the Gospels or you're reading Paul and, and the things that we're called to and how the Lord has worked and the power of the Spirit. And man, I believe, I believe, I believe. And I, you know, on the mountaintop, we believe. I can't tell you the times I've sat there on the mountaintop, which is usually at my desk, and I've thought about our little church here. And I've thought, let's go out there. I'm gonna go on the streets and I'm just gonna talk to people. I'm gonna go where people gather. And I'm gonna hang out there and see if anybody is willing to listen about Jesus. And I'm gonna invite some people to church. I get in my car and I drive around and I see a person here and a person there and I, then I'm going, where do people gather in Round Lake anyway? I, I'm looking for the place where people gather. I don't, I'm not seeing anything. Just seeing a straggler walking here and a straggler walking there. And, and uh, but you know, so maybe I should stop and talk to the straggler, but I don't know, that guy looks like he's in a hurry. If I stop, he's probably gonna be mad that I interrupted him. And, and before you know it, I'm not talking to anybody. On the mountaintop, man, I could see this all coming together and happening, and it's going to be glorious down on the foot of the mountain. It's like, it's at the foot of the mountain where we learn faith, where we really learn faith. Because you don't really learn faith. I'm not talking about saving faith here. I'm talking about walking by faith. You really learn faith when you step out and say, let's see what God does. Because <laughs> I'm at a loss here. But I think the Lord wants me to do this, so I'm just going to step into this and trust the Lord. That's where you really learn faith. Down in the neediness and the opposition and the faithless environment at the foot of the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus' response here is dreadful for a believer to think of receiving from Jesus. Oh, faithless generation. How long do I have to be with you? How long am I going to put up with you? It's like he's saying, my patience is wearing thin here. Boy, we don't want to hear that from Jesus, do we? I mean, the apostles had cast out demons before. Why couldn't they do it now? Well, maybe we get a clue if we jump down to the end of where we're going to be next week in verse 29. They've asked Jesus why we couldn't cast him out. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And some of the, uh, some of the manuscripts say, and fasting. Either way, it's a reliance on the Lord. It's a seeking of the Lord. I'm not able to cast this demon out. And so, Lord, please cast this demon out. It's your power that will do this. But if you've gone out, you've seen the Lord work that way, sometimes you say, yeah, hey, we've been there, we've done that, we've cast out demons, let's go get this thing. You know, and in, and in, the, and in the pride of your own experience, you go out and you try to do the work of God and you fall flat on your face. That might be what had happened here with these nine apostles. So we pray, we go prayerfully, and we lead them to Jesus, not to ourselves. Jesus says, bring him to me. Bring him to me. It's not about the apostles, it's about me, Jesus would say. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is where the power resides. Jesus is where the glory resides. And, and Jesus is the one we're here to represent. Not ourselves, not our churches, not our organizations. Not some speaker we're really into and we think it's the greatest preacher of the word that's ever lived on the planet or something. People get tied up in all this kind of stuff. And people will always let you down, but Jesus is the one we, rep we represent. Jesus is the one we bring people to and we do that prayerfully, prayerfully. And in so doing, at the foot of the mountain, we learn faith. We learn to walk by faith. It's not just something that we feel 
in those glorious moments, it's something that we act upon and believe that God is with us in it. So someday we'll live in a mountaintop experience, but for now, for now, those kinds of glorious times, well, they're here and there. They pop up once in a while. Uh, they are intermittent between times of opposition, between times of human need, between times of faithlessness that we encounter and a lack of faith that we find in our own hearts our own experience. Uh, we, we need to spend those times with the Lord, but we don't stay there. We go down to the foot of the mountain and we get busy with what he wants done in this world and we do it in obedience to him and we do it uh, trusting in him, in his power, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The world needs him. And we need to lean on him and we need to walk with him because it's sometimes an ugly walk that we have to encounter at the foot of the mountain. And we commune with him as often as we can and the mountaintop is good, but we need to let it be preparation for life down at the foot of the mountain. The, the cycle is not complete if all we do is enjoy the time with the Lord. We rise from communing with Jesus and we go to serve Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we bow before you now. You are Lord and King and you are Savior. You are our brother, you are our friend. You are our master. Lord, we are here because of you and we are here for you. May we learn these things that we have seen this morning in this text. May we see uh, our representation of you be good in this difficult world in which we live. A world where there is opposition, a world where there is human need, and a world where there is lack of faith. And yeah, Lord, you are with us in that world. We thank you for the times of refreshing on the mountaintop. We thank you also that you entrust to us your work in this world where people so desperately need you. May we walk by faith and not by sight, allowing the times of communion with you to inspire us, to seek you not only in those private moments, but also down at the foot of the mountain where, the, where there is much to do. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord.